Hey, Slider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Welcome to our 9-11 special. It's called Inspiration After Tragedy, and that's what I want to focus on for this special here. When I think 9-11, uh, one of the first things I think of now is the great 9-11 boat lift, and every American needs to know this story. Uh, on my radio show, we, we tell the story every year. It's one of our traditions. Go back to the day. We're under attack, complete panic. No one knows what's going on at all. And there are hundreds of thousands of people stuck on the tip of lower Manhattan. They're stuck, they have nowhere to go. The Coast Guard sees this and they're completely overwhelmed. One of the Coast Guard guys, he sees a, a small boat on the tip of Manhattan and there were people jumping on the boat and he, there were so many people on the boat he thought it was going to tip over. There's so many people just begging to get on. And he looked off on, on, the, on the, the, the Manhattan and there's just people just as far as he could see. So that's when this guy at the Coast Guard, he had an idea to make a call over the radio. He said, all available boats, this is the U.S. Coast Guard. Anyone who can help with the evacuation of Lower Manhattan, report to Governor's Island. Here's what happened next. I was uncertain of who was gonna respond. About 15, 20 minutes later, there are just boats all across the horizon. Literally, a hundred targets converging on the lower part of Manhattan. When we came out of that dust cloud, tugboats, I've never seen so many tugboats all at once. There was just a, like a fleet of tugboats headed to Manhattan. If it floated and it could get there, it got there. All different size shapes and form. I mean, and they were zooming across this water. Ferries, private boats, party boats. I worked on the water for 28 years. I've never seen that many boats come together one time that fast. One radio call and it just came together just that fast. All the Coast Guard said was, we need your help and people came swarming to help. Which is a nice sentiment, right? But what are these boats gonna do? What are these people gonna do when they get to ground zero? These are, these are tugboat operators. These are fishing boats. These aren't people who know what to do in an emergency evacuation. We need highly trained government employees to make this evacuation work. There's no way regular people could be of any help. They went anyway. And they said people were coming out of the, of the, of the dirt, of the, of the dust, like, like zombies, covered. Look at that. Begging for help. Begging to be rescued off this island. Desperate. And the Coast Guard, they were, they were telling these boat operators, not how many people are you allowed to take, but how many people can you fit on your boat? Nothing mattered anymore. Nothing. You had business executives and people who washed windows. An hour ago, they couldn't have been more different. But now everyone was helping everyone because there were no differences anymore. You had businessmen lifting up old women like surfboards, passing them over the handrails. One of the tugboat operators, he says, I, I saw at one point a husband and a wife reunited on, on our boat. And he said, well, at least we got two back together. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. <laughs> That's so incredible. That's such an awesome American sentiment. Let's keep going. You can't beat that. So we got these made up distinctions, made up class distinctions, the executive, the window washer, and everything in between, right? You got the window washer assumes that the executive is greedy and the, the, uh, the executive thinks the window washer is nothing and nobody, right? And then you have an equalizer, a great equalizer. All of a sudden, we're all the same again. Or we realize that we've always been the same. And we need to help each other because we're all in this together. And that gives me some hope, this, this discord, to say the least, that we have today. I, I pray that it's all fake. I pray that in chaos, in a real tragedy, that we'll come back together. So here we have a profound tragedy, chaos, death, destruction, and 
regular people with no training, no real orders, no organization, helping each other. And the attitude was, let's keep going. People who at first had nothing in common now have everything in common, a common purpose. And look at what we were capable of doing. You couldn't have planned nothing to happen that fast, that quick. No training. This was just people doing what they had to do that day. You forget all about what you're supposed to do, what the teachers do, and you say, you know what? Morally, this is the right way to go. And deep down, this is what I'm going to do. Average people, they stepped up and, uh, when they needed to. They showed me, you know, when the American people need to come together and pull together, they will do it. I do feel a way honored that I was a part of it. It was the greatest thing I ever did with my life. The greatest day that I've ever seen in all my boating. I mean, my life on the water. The great boat lift of 9-11 was the largest sea evacuation in history was larger than the evacuation of Dunkirk during World War II. Dunkirk, 339,000 British and French soldiers were rescued over nine days. 339,000 rescued over nine days. On 9-11, 500,000 civilians were rescued from the tip of Manhattan in less than nine days. Hours. 339 in nine days versus 500,000 in nine hours. And by kept going, these guys kept going. I'm not, I don't know what you, how you interpreted they kept going. The federal government crews, they eventually took over. Four days later, these tugboat operators, these regular guys, they were doing this for four days before federal crews finally took over. One last clip. I believe somebody has a little hero in them. You gotta look in, and it's in there. It'll come out, it need to be. I have one theory in life. I never wanna say the word I should have. If I do it and I fail, I tried. If I do it and I succeed, better for me. And I tell my children the same thing. Never go through life saying you should have. If you want to do something, you do it. You do it, and you keep going. Everyone has a chance to be a hero. And it's a decision we make right now because an opportunity will come. Today's show is dedicated to the victims of 9-11, the official first responders, and everyone else who did anything else that they could to help, all the way down to the tugboat operators. Let's pray that we can one day come together like that again. Coming up next, I want to talk about um, the service members, the men and women who were already in the service when 9-11 happened, and then those who decided to join after, and what came of that. Uh, then we'll talk about all this from a, a spiritual perspective and what lessons need to be learned. And we're going to wrap up with uh, the story of the, the boy with the red bandana. It's all coming up on our 9-11 special, Inspiration from Tragedy. True story. Spread the word. Hey, Study Crusaders, welcome back to our 9-11 tribute special. So Pearl Harbor led to our greatest generation. And 9-11 led to an entirely different generation of amazing Americans who went off to serve in Iraq and Afghanistan, putting aside the politics 
of those wars. Let's focus on the heroes of them. An incredible book that you must buy so that we know the names and stories of these heroes so you can share them with your kids so that their legacies live on. It's called In the Company of Heroes, the inspiring stories of Medal of Honor recipients from America's longest wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it's by James Kitfield, who's also a senior fellow at the Center of Study, Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. James, how are you, sir? I'm doing good. Really good to good talk to you. Um, let's, let's start with the connection here. So 9-11, Iraq, and Afghanistan. We understand the political connections, but take us there from a military aspect. Uh, and the men you write about were, surely they were in the military at the time, or, or were they not? Did they serve before or after? What was their inspiration and connection with 9-11? Well, I mean, um, some of them were in the military at 9-11, and a good many of them uh, volunteered after 9-11. So they volunteered knowing they would, uh, they'd would they be going into combat, but they were, so, uh, they were so energized by what they witnessed in the horror show in 9-11 that they decided they wanted to, you know, come protect their country. So um, you, you got a bit of both. Take us to, um, you can go through 25 of these guys, uh, but it seems like your inspiration for writing this was because of Britt Slabinski. Is that right? Tell us the story of Britt. Yeah, so I was I'm a longtime national security correspondent and the Department of the Navy reached out when Britt was awarded the, uh, the Medal of Honor a few years ago and they offered uh, an exclusive interview so I could do a, a profile of him for a, a media outlet. And uh, I just found his story so uh, inspiring, but also you know heartbreaking and 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 dramatic. That um, I wanted to seek out more of these stories. Uh, in his case, he was leading a Navy SEAL Overwatch team during the first really big battle uh, with with Al Qaeda and the Taliban after we invaded uh, Afghanistan, and they were to be inserted on a mountaintop to do Overwatch for this battle of uh, it was called Operation Anaconda, and. Because of timing got screwed up, they had to uh, insert them right at the very top of the mountain instead of farther down where they could then sort of egress into their overwatch position stealthily. And when they were being inserted at night, uh, they they basically came down right in the midst of a, a bunch of Al-Qaeda ambushers who shot up the helicopter. It barely got away and crash landed a few miles away, but they realized they had lost one of their SEAL teammate members in the, when, when the helicopter was trying to sort of regain altitude. Um, and so they had, you know, had been in, experienced a crash landing, they got back to base, uh, and they had to make a decision what to do. And, and it was up to Britt Slabinski to make that decision of, do they go back up to the top of the mountain at, at night to fight a larger uh, formation of Al Qaeda fighters who were, you know, dug in up there or were they going to uh, leave their, their fallen comrade behind? Um, he decides they're going back up, knowing that it's probably a, a suicide mission, and all of his four team members go back up with him. They all nod and say, okay, let's go get them. So that right there was just amazing to me. The odds that, that they faced were in, incredible. Indeed, they, they as soon as they get up to the top of the mountain again, the, the, the helicopter drops them off, and they're in the middle of an ambush. Um, they run face into these machine gun emplacements, uh, neutralize a couple of them, but uh, John Chapman, who is their Air Force uh, air liaison, is shot and, and presumed dead. Another one of them is wounded. They eventually have to retreat off that mountain. Uh, what was really stunning was that uh, drones showed that 12 minutes after John Chapman was sh presumed shot dead, he comes back, he comes, you know, regains consciousness and fights on for another 15, 20 minutes by himself, tragically. Uh, quick reaction force is sent up to to get him. Um, uh, uh, tragically, he, he gives his life trying to give cover to the helicopter, and the helicopter is indeed shot down, and they lose a number of other special forces troops in the quick reaction force. So it was just this Homeric tale where they were confronted with plenty of points where they could have done the easy thing, could have done the safer thing, and each time um, these people risk their lives to, to accomplish the mission and not leave any of their, of their uh, comrades behind, and I just found that very inspiring. Yeah, that's, I was going to say, it, I said, what's the story there? It, it's, it's never leave a man behind, right? Against all odds, all costs, never leave a man behind. Right, right. And, and they went up there and sacrificed their lives to, 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 to try to bring their comrades out. The stories that, uh, there's obviously many that always impress me, but 
uh, are the ones that involve live grenades. <laughs> and, and the guys who jump on them or throw them right before they explode. And those stories amaze me because you don't make that decision in the, in the moment. Right, you don't you don't have a live grenade in front of you, and then you contemplate, you know, what do I do now? Do I jump on it? Do I throw it? Do I what do I do? You've made that decision a long time before a live grenade uh, appears in front of you, and this was your chance to prove it. And you have a couple stories like that in the book. Tell us tell us a couple. Um, I mean, there there are quite a number of those stories. Whether it was uh, jumping on a grenade um, in the case of uh, Kyle Carpenter, for instance, he's a he's a marine. He's He's sitting, and, and like you said, these guys think this through beforehand because you're right, they don't have any time to think it through when the grenade drops at their feet. Uh, he and a, and, a, and a comrade were sitting on top of a, 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 a behind some uh, fortress sandbags on top of a roof in, in uh, Helmand province. Uh, and they're talking about what would you do if, you know, if we, we face a big attack, et cetera, what would you do, you know, if we have to fight up? by ourselves up here. And uh, indeed, a grenade does land at their feet. Kyle Carpenter jumps on the grenade, it explodes, and he miraculously survives, but has to go through uh, two plus years of really excruciating rehabilitation, uh, scores of, of, of operations, um, just, just really uh, profound uh, traumatic injuries. Uh, the, would embitter many people, I think, but he found uh, he, he found a reason to live, uh, and he's become kind of a warrior philosopher, uh, speaking to veterans groups and others about um, persevering and being resilient. And uh, so he he has just an incredibly inspiring story, and he's used this as a as a as a vehicle to try to improve other people's lives. So he's just an incredible guy. But he's very indicative of people who. Numerous examples of people who were, were faced with, do I sacrifice myself or do I save myself but lose my comrades? And they sacrifice themselves willingly. And it's just, uh, it's an amazing thing. It's the best of us. On that point, um, what do all these guys, what, what are some differences between all the guys you've characterized? And then what are, what's the one or two things that they all have in common that you think we should all uh, embrace in our lives best we can? Well, the difference is they, they come from all over um, the country. They come from big cities and small towns and rural areas uh, from the south, the mountain west, the northeast. So they're, they're, there are communities around this country, all over this country, in California, that, uh, that are producing these really standout individuals. So that that mm -hmm. struck me. It was not any one, not, not sort of grouped in any geographic area. They're coming from all over the place. And that's that kind of impressed me that there are communities, you know, that are that are teaching these kids uh, to grow up and embrace this kind of selfless service. Uh, the commonality is just that they all of these guys exhibit um, a selflessness. You know, when it came down to it, um, they didn't take the easy choice. They took the hard choice, um, and to the point of, in many cases, sacrificing their own lives. But in in, in each case. There was a time when they could have um, they could have done the easier thing, and so the Medal of Honor. There's a phrase be above and beyond the call of duty. These guys all went above and beyond the call of duty to uh, selflessly protect and try to save their friends rather than their own lives, and that's uh, that's a pretty inspiring thing. Yeah, what is that? If you can go deeper into that, because that's incredible. It's the whenever I talk to whenever I talk to our World War II veterans. The common thread for them was always, man, what you did was incredible and amazing, inspiring. And they're th always like, I was just doing my job. You know what I mean? It's like the super humble, is just doing my job. You know, no big deal, whatever. It's like, come on. Uh, and it's similar to the selflessness of these guys today. Like, what is that? What, how could that, like, how, how do they possibly have that when we live in especially such a narcissistic culture? Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. And I found the same thing. These guys are incredibly humble. The humility just comes after them, and I think it's it's from um, having seen what they've seen. There's you know all these stories. These guys were all standouts, but there is valor in all of these stories and all the people involved. Uh, so everyone in sort of in this book has basically you know faced great odds and 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 decided that they were going to you know sacrifice, as I said, for the greater good of the of the team. 
And I, I have to say, the military is very good at that. It inculcates a, uh, I mean, you, the people who, uh, the military, I mean, the, you, there's this kind of a, an image of sort of the, the brash drill sergeants yelling in people's faces, et cetera. But the people who um, are promoted in the military are people who show a selflessness, a willingness to um, sacrifice for others. That is, it is, uh, it's encouraged in them, and that training um, comes through in times of, of great pressure and stress. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it, it's it's partly that these are standout individuals, and it's partly that the training they get encourages them to to be like this. And that's why all these guys say this is not my Medal of Honor. This goes to everybody else and to all the men who didn't make it back and all that. And they, they, they genuinely believe that. Uh, go read the book. Our kids need to know these stories, uh, especially. This, this is the antidote to our narcissistic culture, are, are these stories here. In the Company of Heroes by James Kitfield. James, appreciate your hard work on all this. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Think about the, the stories that uh, our kids are fed in school and pop culture, where it's all about me, 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 me. And you instead shower them with these stories, these Medal of Honor recipients, that's uh, life-changing. True story, Mike Slater, spread the word. Hey, Slater Crusaders, welcome back to our special about 9-11. There's two themes that I want to introduce in this segment with our next guest. The first is uh, obviously the spiritual angle of this all. It can't be ignored. And the second is, this was 20 years ago, so we're now in a phase where we need to think about how we're going to pass this lesson down to the next generation, which is crazy to think about. But alas, here we are. One of my favorite people, Dave Engelhardt, is a pastor at King's Church in New York City is with us right now. Pastor, how are you, sir? Hey, Mike, I'm doing great. Good to be on. Glad you're here. Can you, can you take us back to the um, the day, just the, the, the shock and despair of the moment? Yeah, I, um, I, I, was, I was 20 years old. Well, I remember when 9-11 happened. My, um, all of my family is from New York City, and I had, um, we grew up a little bit upstate, but I had just moved to the West Coast. And so, you know, talking about hitting home, we ha I certainly had friends that had lost family members. And now being a pastor in New York City, you know, uh, you, Mike, I, there's all kinds of, there's jokes about 9-11. Um, I, you know, I was watching a, a roast recently. They were making fun of, you know, people who died. And there are still people that I talk to on a regular basis whose lives are deeply impacted um, spiritually from the tra tragedy that took place. Uh, even in my law practice, I, I had a client last year that uh, was on his deathbed with cancer as related to carcinogens um, and was working downtown at the time during 9-11. So, you know, there's the, there's the direct effect of the tragedy that, that befell the individuals that were in the two towers. But then and there's the on the circular impact that happened to the rest of the individuals in New York City that were living under literally the fog of terror, the aftermath of chaos and cancer and all of those other things that people don't really think about that not only affected but continue to affect people um, that lived under this horrific attack by our enemies. That's the right way to say it. You know, we believe there's actual evil in the world and we believe that as believers, we have a call to stand up and declare uh, God's justice and righteousness, not just mercy, but 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 establishing justice first and then mercy second. And, um, you know, the believers don't understand that. They think we're supposed to just say, you know, we forgive you. It, it passed. But we're also supposed to, we're, we're also called to create boundaries and borders to protect our people and our nation so we can have freedom that goes another generation. So we don't get overrun by ideologies that produce death and chaos in our cities. On the, the shock part, um, there's so much evil all the time in the world and either we're numb to it or our hearts are so hardened we don't even think it's evil anymore. Uh, but this was, this was like a jolt, right? This was like a shocking jolt, obvious in your face, repeated over and over on cable news, could not be ignored. Um, and maybe can you speak to the, the evilness that's around us all the time? 
uh, in our fallen, broken world that we don't see or whatever, but couldn't miss it 20 years ago. Yeah, it's fundamental to Christianity that evil and tragedy is a part of our life. And the cheap cut, you know, dollar store version is that you get saved, Christ comes into your life, everything's okay. But that's not true. It's never been true. Jesus came to bring a kingdom of, of heaven, and he said, you know, of its government and peace, there shall be no end. Well, what does that mean? That means that there is no peace in the world. That means without this system, we have a system that is fundamentally chaotic, fundamentally tyrannical. You know, I have a buddy um, who's a Catholic priest, the father of a church a couple of blocks from my church. And on the morning of 9-11, he saw and heard, because he was close enough to the towers, the, 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 the first crash, and he ran down to the towers, and he was there, and he's trying to talk to people. And he told me about the moment that the towers fell down, and he was in front of... Um, one of the one of the uh, uh, old churches right right there blocks away from the twin towers and told me he was holding on to the gates as this cloud of dust fell and covered everything. It was he said it was pitch dark for a couple of for a couple of minutes and then it started the dust started to settle and he was covered and all these people were covered. They saw the um, his frock and people would run up to him weeping and fall in his arms. And, and it was for hours that he was walking around, hugging people, praying for them, weeping with people, mourning with those who mourned. And it shows you that below the surface of our humanity and our iPhones and all of this stuff that's put together is this desperation for existential uh, uh, order, for someone to say, is God real? Does he care about me? Does he know me? It, you know, evil is real. And then in that moment where human beings have a reckoning with evil and tragedy, um, and God and, and their own mortality, it, they immediately turn to desperation for God. That's the danger of the society we live in, when the news cycle, everything is me-centric, it's emergencies to, to preserve my life. But in a moment like that where tragedy shakes fundamentally a human being, they recognize that there is a desperation in the whole human soul for connection to God, and that's who this Catholic priest represented. He represented someone who's, who was... God being there in the midst of our pain. And that's, you know, that's the lesson of the cross that Jesus comes and experiences pain on our behalf. And he doesn't say, I'm coming to wave a wand to make pain go away, but I'm walking with you through pain and through tragedy. And through those times, we can find the beauty and solace of faith. Mm, beautiful. The Michael W. Smith song, Breathe, one of the lines is, I'm, I'm desperate for you, I'm lost without you. And my wife and I have been thinking a lot about this idea of being desperate for God, and we're just not anymore, not in our modern world. Is that a new thing? Is the, is the ah, it can't be. I don't know. Let, let me ask you. This, this idea of being numbed out to the, to the tragedy of life, uh, yeah. is that new, or is it just on hyperdrive because of technology and the rest? Yeah, I don't know if it is. I've been reading a lot of John Wesley, and if you get a chance, uh, Mike, check out this book, uh, John Wesley Before and After. Uh, and they, they historically, it's, 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 it's dense, but they talk about the world of the United of Britain specifically before and after Wesley, and, and the tragedy and the crime and murder. Like this is this is what the book cites that people wouldn't even travel the roads during the middle of the day without guards with them, without some kind of security detail, because the people were so corrupted and so wicked. They were so there was so much avarice and greed. It was so much about that time and that moment. And Wesley came and said, yo, there's a there's an afterlife and God is not happy with us and you will stand one day before a judgment and again when we when we're talking about a tragedy like 9/11 the issue is that God cares he's not happy about this and men will stand before him and stand before a judgment and he'll say what did you do with your life and Wesley in England the reformation of the Methodist movement and the first great awakening brought incredible reformation to that society without which they would have had a similar revolution to the French Revolution it would have been bloody, it would have been chaotic, and it would have spawned an atheistic regime that is dark and confusing. Um, Wesley's Methodism brought order and brought light and brought really salvation to the people of England. So I don't think it's unique for our culture, but I do think that cultures go through uh, pendulum swings of of narcissism and then back to reckoning themselves with God. And that often happens by tragedy. Unfortunately, you know, Jesus said in the book of Matthew, we played a wedding song for you. 
The wedding song is, I want you to dance. My mercy's there for you. I made the world. It's beautiful. Garden of Eden, sunsets, butterflies. And some people respond to that, but most people don't. And then he said, and then we sang a dirge for you. And a dirge is a wedding march. It means your death is soon. It's impending. Then you must reckon yourself to your creator. And Jesus says, you know, we sang both of these songs to you, and that's really the methodology of the kingdom of heaven is that both songs at different cycles of culture, different times of man are necessary to sing. And I believe, Mike, because the church has been so, you know, smiley, white tooth preacher that we need to actually swing back into, yo, you're in sin and you're going to wake up one day and said, hey, I threw a Hail Mary past prayer. Didn't, wasn't that sufficient? And Jesus is going to be like, no, I, I said repent for the kingdom of heaven is here and repent means make a fundamental change turn from your way turn from your sin and then the kingdom of, he of, of heaven is here you know that scripture mike people cite it you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free jesus didn't say that he said if you obey my commandments then you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free we have church <laughs> this cheap gospel that is just like, believe, believe, believe. And Jesus said, no, behave, and then you'll believe, and then you'll understand why I'm telling you to behave, and then you'll have a reformation like what happened with Wesley. And right now, again, we're living in a, a time of minor tragedies. We have coronavirus, we have the incredible Afghanistan tragedy. And I think from God's per perspective, he's like, we've sang songs of wedding marches, and now there's a dirge that's worldwide and his heart's desire is for us to turn our ways and walk in righteousness and repentance always every time brings blessing and we saw that in new york city the churches were full after 9 11. i have friends that started churches at that time and then they were you know their church plans they keep, nobody's coming and the tragedy happens all of a sudden their churches pack become packed and people actually have a reformation of their life and their lives change and they start having children and families are created and built and they realize the really valuable things and then the iPhones and the IRAs and your retirement and the second house that has less value and less importance and the important things rise to the surface. And I hope that's what this time does for people. I hope they remember through the tragedy of 9-11, the things that are really valuable, the things like life and family. Those are the axiomatic things that God gave us. All the rest of the things are the icing on the cake. But if we're missing those basic things, loving our kids, loving our spouses, laying down our lives for our neighbors, then we miss the whole thing. Then it doesn't matter if we have wealth. It doesn't matter if we have iPhones. All of those things will just replicate systems of bondage as opposed to replicating systems of freedom and blessing. I'm so glad those churches were full right afterwards with everything you just said, but I, I question whether that, that, that lasted long, right? And we look at the, the state of you know, the church today. Uh, yeah. It's not great. Um, mm. So, I don't know. I wish it lasted. And, yeah. you know, another, we'll take another tragedy to get people to, to think about what a wretch they are and how Jesus saves again, or is that ship sailed? Yeah, I, yeah, and that's the problem with humanity is what is we have moments to respond, but if we don't take the moment to respond, then it's gone. And you know, there's these parables about you know one man sleeping, the other person is taken, one person is work, walking in, uh, working in the field, the other one's immediately taken, and the and the emblems are there are moments in time with which humanity can respond to God, but those windows aren't open for all of time. And a lot of us say, oh, we'll catch it next time. God will be gracious next time. And what if he's not? What if that window passes? What if he says, hey, look, I gave you an opportunity. God is not a prostitute. He doesn't display his love cheaply. His love is really valuable. Proverbs says that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it's the glory of kings to seek a matter out. The concept is that the people that God's called with you know, honor or royalty, or if you're a person to walk that walks in honor, you pursue God. You're someone who seeks God and his beauty is hidden. And that's because all valuable things are hidden. Like, you know, you don't see diamonds sitting on the sidewalk. You don't see gold ore hanging from trees. God made the universe so that the people that are seeking him will always find him. And those that aren't seeking him, he says, look, I gave you a universe. I gave you family. I gave you love. And you decided not to pursue me. And and through, whether it's beauty or tragedy, God's voice is still the same. It's calling sons and daughters 
back in reconciliation with relationship with him, just like his primary intention was in the Garden of Eden, to know us and to be known with us. I don't know if, Mike, you heard that John Voigt um, uh, a testimony. He shared it on Tucker. He shared a salvation story on Tucker recently, and he said he was sitting in his room, and he was saying out loud, I can't believe the world is so difficult. Why is it so difficult? And he heard an audible voice that said, it's supposed to be difficult. And he realized, this is what he said. He said, I realized I was known, that God actually cared about me enough to speak to me, that he actually directed his intention towards me, that he would say, the world is painful and tough. And that's actually part of the way it's it, it's fundamentally created to drive you towards God. And that's important. Like God is seeking the heart of man. And these opportunities are opportunities for man to turn to God. And if I hope we would go, you know, we would have a, a better place. I hope, Pastor, you've inspired people to do that now so that the next time uh, people are covered in a black dust cloud, uh, yeah. we can be, all be a light for them to fall into the arms to. Pastor Dave Engelhart, King's Church, New York City. Go uh, learn more about his church. If you're in the area, go. If you're visiting, visit. Pastor, wonderful to talk to you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Hey, Sighted Crusaders, welcome back to our 9-11 special, Inspiration from Tragedy. Uh, we all need to know the story of the man with the red bandana. Starts off with the boy, Wells. He was six years old, and his dad called him over, and his dad folded up uh, a white pocket square, folded it up all nice and neat, and put it in the pocket of his son's shirt. And said, son, this right here, this one's for show. And then his dad took out a red bandana, folded it up all messy, and said, here, son, this one is for blow. <laughs> you keep this one in your pocket, because you never know when you're going to need it. He was six years old. He never stopped carrying it. Wells always carried his red bandana. From six years old, he never left the house without his red bandana. There's pictures of him as a little boy riding his bike, playing in the backyard. He always had his red bandana. When he was older, he loved working as a junior firefighter in town. Uh, always had his red bandana. He was the captain of a sports team. His high school yearbook quote was, there's no I in team. He always had his red bandana. Played the cross at Boston College. Always wore his red bandana under his helmet. It was his connection to his dad. Wells graduated college, became an equities trader in New York City worked on the 104th floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center. A couple years into his job, he called his dad. He said, Dad, I, I don't want to be an equity trader anymore. I want to change my career. I want to become a New York City firefighter. He said, if I sit in front of this computer screen for my entire life, I'll go crazy. It wasn't but a couple weeks later, September 11th, that plane struck the North Tower. He was in the South Tower. And he called his mom. Mom, this is Wells. I, I want you to know that I'm okay. Ben. There was a sky lobby in the 38th floor. 200 people were waiting for the elevator when the plane hit, threw everyone to the, to the ground. A few people survived that. Uh, one woman wiped blood from her glasses. She looked around and everyone was dead. She thought she was the only person alive. But there were a few more. She couldn't see anything. She was terrified to step anywhere. She thought the whole floor would collapse. And there was nowhere to go. It was pitch black, nowhere to escape. And she finally heard a voice. He said, I found a way out. I found the stairs. Follow me. And the woman said, it was the way he said it. We got up and followed. And you heard it in that phone call to his mom. You heard how calm he was. So he led that group down to the 61st floor, dropped them off with a bunch of firefighters who led them down to the elevators on the 40th floor. And after he met the firefighters, he turned around and went back up the stairs. He could have kept going down with them and been totally fine. Like morally, in his conscience, he would have been totally fine, right? Look at all these people I, I helped. But he turned around and he went back up another 17 flights of stairs 
It's what we talked about in the first segment with the, with the great the 9-11 boat lift. Regular people doing very irregular things, heroic things, noble, manly things. And they kept going. Wells kept going. He found a woman on the 78th floor. She's never talked publicly, but she told her husband, who was with her in the hospital, that there was a man who appeared out of nowhere. And he said, everyone who can stand, stand. Everyone who can help others, help. Those are exact words. And he let everyone who was there, who could, who could walk, let him down the stairways again, dropped him off with firefighters, and went back into the smoke. His mom and dad were watching on TV. And they saw the tower collapse. His mom said her heart broke at that that moment. She knew he was killed. And his dad screamed, God, take me now. Leave him here, take me. Six months later, Wells' body was found in the rubble next to uniformed firefighter. Two months after that, Wells' mom was reading the New York Times, and the New York Times had a series of stories about survivors of 9-11 and she was reading and, and one of the women uh, in, the, in the series spoke about this mysterious man, a man she's never met before who came out of nowhere and helped us all find some firefighters and she said, I, I, can't, I can't describe him other than to say he was wearing a red bandana. Mom read that and said to her husband, oh my God, Wells, found you, the man with the red bandana. So mom sent a picture of her son to the woman, and she said, yeah, that's him. No question in my mind. His dad said that Wells took off his equity trader hat and put on his firefighter hat once again. Wells is the first citizen to be made an honorary member of the New York City Fire Department. And in his hometown fire station, the station that he spent hours in as a junior firefighter when he was a boy, there's a picture of him. Guys, can you play that last B-roll one more time? It's, this is him. This is the last picture that the firefighters see as they run out and answer a call. There's a plaque outside the fire station. And it says, dedicated in memory of firefighter Wells Remy Crowder, the equity trader, the boy in the red bandana, the man who never went anywhere without his red bandana. When tragedy comes, will you be like Wells? Or are you going to say, oh, no, no, I'm just, uh, I'm just a real estate agent. I'm just a marketing guy. Uh, Wells was an equity trader. Hated his job. Just like the tugboat operator in the first segment. We all got a little hero in us somewhere. So no more I'm just a. Wells will always be remembered as a firefighter. He was an equity trader. And it doesn't take a 9-11 for that hero to come out. If you keep your eyes open, you'll find a moment to be one today. That's the lesson of 9-11. Inspiration from tragedy. Spread the word.